Hey, what's up everybody? Mr. White here. We are continuing into electrostatics by looking at electric fields today. But before we do that, I want to recap Coulomb's law real quick. Now, if we analyze this a bit further, we can see that electric force is directly proportional to the amount of charge of the two objects interacting, and it is inversely proportional to the distance between those objects. And because of that distance squared, changes in distance have an exponential effect on force. Let's think about magnets. They work in a similar fashion. If I put two magnets together, there is a force between them. If I increase the strength of those magnets, that force increases as well. But if I increase the distance between those magnets by pulling them apart, that force drops significantly. These are the same set of relationships that are seen with electric forces as well. Now an electric field describes the area around a charged particle where the other charged particles would feel a force. The strength of the field depends on the particle's charge and the distance from the particle as described by Coulomb's law. And we can show the field of this particle using an electric field diagram. Now there are four rules that we are going to use to draw electric fields. But first we're going to take a look at an example that leads us into our first rule. Now let's say I have a positive source charge and I want to describe the field around that charge. I would use a test charge to place in the field. And just as the name denotes, a test charge tests the field. We watch its behavior to see what it does in the field and that helps us describe the source charge. Now let's say I could turn myself into a positive test charge and place myself near this positive source charge that I'm trying to describe. Well, when I place myself really close, Coulomb's law tells me that the smaller the distance, the stronger the force. And so if I'm really close, I'm going to feel a lot of force. And because our charges are the same, I'm going to feel a repulsive force, a push away. Now, the further I get from this charge, if I test another point, say here, I'm going to feel less force. And if I test a point even further away, I feel even less force. But notice with the vectors that I've drawn, I have essentially drawn a straight line away from the positive test charge. This is an electric field line. I can do this anywhere around that positive source charge, and I end up with an electric field diagram for this charge. Now let's say I stay as a positive test charge, and I put myself near now a negative source charge because I want to describe the field around a negative source charge. Well, opposites attract, and so I'm going to feel an attractive force towards this negative source charge. And the closer I get to that source charge, the more force I feel. But again, you'll notice all of these lines I'm drawing, I've essentially drawn field lines for this negative charge. And I can do this anywhere around the negative charge to draw a field diagram for that charge. Now this brings us to rule number one of drawing electric field diagrams. The diagrams are drawn based on what a positive test charge does in the field. In other words, if I place a positive charge in a field, what's it going to do? This is what the arrows should indicate. Now this doesn't mean that it, you can't figure out what a negative charge would do in the field based on the diagram. A negative charge would simply do the opposite of what the diagram indicates. Now, if you need a catchy way to remember that the arrow should show how a positive test charge reacts in a field, try this. What would a cat do in the field? Well, a cat has paws, positive, positive charge. What would a positive charge do in the field? And that might just be cringy enough for you to never forget it. Now, since we draw electric fields indicating what a positive test charge would do, Whenever we draw an electric field diagram for a positive source charge, the arrows are always going to be pointing away to show that the source charge is going to repel that positive test charge. For negative source charges, we are always going to draw the arrows towards the negative charge, showing the attractive force between the negative charge and the positive test charge. Now, because electric fields are infinite in how far they can extend, these field lines technically would extend an infinite distance away from the charge. We do know from Coulomb's law, though, that as you get further and further away from the charge, the force decreases dramatically. And so once you get a certain distance away, the field is negligible at that point. 
All right, rule number two for drawing electric field lines. If we want to show a stronger field, we draw more arrows. And so if we look at the examples at the bottom of the page, picture there, we have charge A has the fewest amount of arrows, which indicates it's the weakest charge. Charge B has a few more arrows drawn around it, and charge C has the most by far. You'll notice though that they are all equally distant from each other when coming from the charge, and that is a must. We can't draw any arrows closer to each other on one part of the charge and further away on the other part of the charge. That would imply that the charge in the field is of different strengths around the charge, and that's just not accurate. And speaking of arrows and how to draw them, rule number three is that arrows are always going into or coming out of a charge at a 90 degree angle. And so all of those arrows look just fine except for that bottom one, which is a little crooked. And that is not a 90 degree angle coming from the charge. And so in order to correctly draw these diagrams, you need to equally space your arrows and make sure that they are coming out of the charge or going into the charge at a 90 degree angle. Now, before we talk about rule four, I want to ask a question. What happens if we put our positive test charge into a field that's made from more than one source charge? If I were to take a positive test charge and put it in between a positive source charge and a negative source charge, what do you think would happen? Turns out it's the same process we've been using. We just have to consider the force from both charges. Let's take a look at an example and see how that works. In this example, I'm going to start with a positive source charge and a negative source charge, and I'm going to place my positive test charge closest to the positive source charge. Now, we know from earlier examples in Coulomb's law that the closer the charges are together, the more that repulsion force, that pushing away force, like charges have. And so the force on the test charge from the positive source charge is really strong. It's pushing away quite a bit, trying to get it to go this way. But we can't ignore the negative source charge either. That is applying a very small, but it is applying a force to the test charge as well. It is attracting it. They are opposite uh, charges. And so this charge over here is trying to pull our test charge in this direction. The amount of force from our positive charge though is much stronger. And so the resulting vector between those two interactions is going to point mostly in this direction with a slight tilt towards this charge. Now I'm going to analyze this again, except from a bit different position. We know that the positive test charge was pushed in this direction, and it was pushed a little bit in this direction towards our negative source charge. And so I'm going to analyze here. Now the force from the positive test source charge is a little weaker now because it's the test charge is further away. The force from this source charge over here, the negative source charge is going to be a little bit stronger. It's going to play a little bit more of a role in the direction that our test charge is going to move in. And so the resulting vectors of those two interactions at this point here is going to be a little bit more angled towards the negative charge. Now, if I do this over and over and I test a few more positions, we start to see that as the force from the positive source charge decreases because the test charge is moving away from it, the force from the negative source charge is increasing because that test charge is moving closer to it. And now if we look at all these resulting vectors, we've basically drawn an arc, a, a field line from the positive to the negative charges. And that is what actually happens when you have a field that's made up of a positive and negative source charge. So again, when we're working with multiple source charges, we have to consider the effects from all of those source charges on our positive test charge. And so that's where we're going to start seeing curved lines. Now, when we start seeing some interesting fields is when we start drawing the fields involving like charges. For a positive and negative charge making up the field, it's pretty straightforward. A positive test charge is repelled from the positive charge and attracted to the negative charge. So we are basically drawing lines from the positive charge to the negative charge, as we saw earlier. This formed these loops between the two charges where their individual field lines are added together. Now where it gets interesting are where there are two like charges. Both positive charges will repel a positive test charge, so we draw arrows outward from them as always. But what happens when we get to the field between them? Well, since both charges repel a positive test charge, their individual fields would look as if they're repelling each other. 
When we draw this, we will end up with an infinitesimally small area in between them that a charge won't ever go. Think of both positive charges reaching out to push the test charge away at the same time. This is the same for a pair of negative charges, except the arrows are directed towards the negative charges. Both negative charges will attempt to attract the positive test charge, so there will be once again an infinitesimally small region between them where a charge will never go, as it would be pulled towards one of the charges or the other. Here's another look at different combinations. Now keep in mind there is an infinite number of combinations with more charges. Now with all of that said, with all of the crazy diagrams that we've been seeing, rule number four is that electric field lines never cross each other. Field lines never intersect. That wouldn't make sense if field lines are determined by testing an infinite number of points for the resulting forces from multiple charges. If they overlap, we would be saying that that one point has two different sets of vectors uh, two different sets of effects from the same charges, and that just wouldn't make sense. Now, that may seem complicated, but what you need to know basically is that they should never cross each other. All right, there you have it, our four rules for drawing electric field lines and diagrams. If you need additional help, please ask. Try checking out the video again, and make sure you have the four rules written down. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.